Hello, and welcome to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's 2022 Graduate Fellowship Program Capitol Hill Briefing Series. I'm Marco Davis, President and CEO of CHCI. This series is the culmination of CHCI's premier nine-month graduate fellowship program, which offers exceptional emerging Hispanic leaders unparalleled hands-on experience in public policy. This unique fellowship program seeks to enhance participants' leadership abilities, strengthen their professional skills, and increase the presence of Latinos in public policy areas. Hello, and welcome to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's 2022 Graduate Fellowship Program Capitol Hill Briefing Series. I'm Marco Davis, President and CEO of CHCI. This series is the culmination of CHCI's premier nine-month graduate fellowship program, which offers exceptional emerging Hispanic leaders unparalleled hands-on experience in public policy. This unique fellowship program seeks to enhance participants' leadership abilities, strengthen their professional skills, and increase the presence of Latinos in public policy areas, most notably in the areas of health, technology, housing, energy, social equity, child welfare, and education. CHCI is thrilled to be able to offer our graduate fellows the opportunity to share their perspectives on policy issues that they're passionate about and convene leaders in this work for an informative conversation. Now, we'd like to thank our Graduate Fellowship Program sponsors for supporting the program, including Facebook, the PepsiCo Foundation, America's Health Insurance Plans, BBVA, Casey Family Programs, the Walton Family Foundation, the American Petroleum Institute, DaVita, Wells Fargo, and CVS Health. You can keep today's conversation going by using the hashtag CHCIFellows on social media. And please visit chci.org to learn more about our graduate fellowship program, as well as our other leadership programs and special events. And we encourage you to reach out to our fellows via LinkedIn to find out more about their policy work and help them connect with job opportunities for when the program concludes in May. Now let's get to the briefing. Enjoy the discussion. Hello, my name is Caroline Gonzalez-Scott, Vice President of Programs at CHCI. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia, representing Illinois' 4th Congressional District. Hi, I'm Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia, proudly representing the 4th District of Illinois. I'm happy to welcome you to today's second session of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's 2022 Capitol Hill Policy Briefing Series entitled Racializing Immigration, the Targeting and Criminalization of Latino Communities, moderated by Dulce Dominguez. Immigration policy in the U.S. has a history deeply rooted in racially discriminatory laws that have resulted in the criminalization and mass deportation of Latino and Black communities. For decades, We've witnessed families forcibly separated at the hands 
of a system that consistently violates the rights of immigrants in our country. The rise in anti-immigrant rhetoric has equated immigrants to criminals and normalized the use of racial profiling to target Latino and black immigrants. It is time that we address the harms of the past and restore the fundamental principles of due process to keep families together and dismantle prison to deportation pipeline. That is why I introduced a new way forward a bill that gives us a historic opportunity to end the criminalization of migrants and end the scourge of family separation. It's a path toward an immigration system based in dignity and racial justice. The new way forward would end mandatory immigration detention and the facilities that profit off of family separation, end the prison to deportation pipelines so that people don't get deported for a minor traffic violation, end automatic deportation for people who have had contact with the criminal legal system, sometimes decades ago. Today's briefing is not only important, but timely. You will hear today from experts across different sectors about the ways in which enforcement in the U.S. disproportionately targets Latinos and the negative impact that this has on our entire country. Immigrants are embedded in the fabric of the U.S. and represent rich diversity that makes us stronger. They are essential members of our communities and deserve to be treated with dignity. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you today's moderator, Dulce Dominguez. Dulce is a Mexican immigrant and current DACA recipient from the state of Illinois. She is this year's CHCI Social Equity Graduate Fellow and completed her placement serving her hometown as a legislative fellow focused on immigration policy for the 10th Congressional District. Dulce graduated with a degree in social work from Northeastern University in Illinois and in 2019 obtained her master's in social science administration from the University of Chicago's Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. She has dedicated her life to supporting community-led advocacy by organizing and working with nonprofit organizations in Illinois to help address the structural racism and inequities impacting the Latino and immigrant community. Thank you again for attending today's panel, and I hope you enjoy this necessary discussion. Thank you, Congressman Garcia. I appreciate the kind introduction and commend you for the great contributions you have made to Latino and immigrant communities in Illinois and throughout the country. Without a doubt, your leadership has continued to bring awareness to the systemic racism and the social inequities that have resulted from this unfair and unjust immigration system in the US. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dulce Dominguez. I use she, her pronouns, and I am this year's CHCI Social Equity Graduate Fellow. I am excited to welcome you to the 2022 series of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute Policy Briefing entitled Racializing Immigration, the Targeting and Criminalization of Latino Communities. I am honored and proud to be able to moderate today's discussion alongside this great panel of experts who will each provide a unique and distinct perspective on the U.S. immigration system and its impact on Latino communities. Growing up undocumented in a mixed status household influenced much of the way that I understand and interact with the world. As a high school student, I remember the initial phase of learning what it truly meant to be undocumented, what it meant for my family and my future. Throughout the realization process, there was also a phase of guilt and questioning of my own values and morals. Hearing anti-immigrant rhetoric, seeing immigrants portrayed as criminals in the news by our government, and so many experiences that pushed me to seek answers and understand where all of this came from. That is why today's panel is so important to me and why I am grateful to have our group of experts who have spearheaded such important work to ensure that immigrant communities are valued and treated with dignity. While immigration policies are not explicitly written to discriminate or single out a specific racial or ethnic group, enforcement of these policies has resulted in unequal consequences for Latinos and black communities. Data tells a clear story of a racially targeted enforcement system. According to an annual ICE report from fiscal year 18, 
more than 90% of the individuals detained and deported came from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, despite that population comprising only 70% of the non-citizen population. Additionally, evidence shows that while only 7% of non-citizens in the U.S. are Black, they make up 20% of those facing deportation on criminal grounds. Immigration enforcement in the U.S. does not only have consequences for those that are undocumented, but it has a significant impact on their families and communities, many of whom are U.S. citizens themselves. The policies that govern the immigration system and the U.S. response to historical events like the tragedy of 9-11 have helped equate immigrants to criminals. But just how did immigration become a criminal offense? And how has the current system specifically targeted certain racial and ethnic groups? This panel will touch on the history of immigration in the U.S., current enforcement policy and implementation programs, and their impacts on Latino and other communities of color in the U.S. and also after deportation. I will now introduce our panel of experts. With us today is Oscar Chacon, co-founder and executive director of Alianza Americas. Oscar is a known expert on U.S. Latin America relations and a frequent national and international spokesperson on transnationalism, economic justice, human mobility, migration policies, racism and xenophobia, and U.S. Latino community issues. Welcome, Oscar. Thank you very much, Dulce. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. We also have Dr. Angela Garcia, Assistant Professor at the University of Chicago's Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. Dr. Garcia is a scholar of migration, membership, law, and the state with the focus on undocumented migration and U.S. immigration federalism. She is also the co-author of the award-winning book, Legal Passing, Navigating Undocumented Life and Local Immigration Law. Welcome, Dr. Garcia. Thank you so much for having me. Finally, Maggie Loredo, co-founder and director of Otros Dreams and Acción, also known as ODA, based in Mexico. Maggie was forced to return and has been living in Mexico since 2008. She is an artivist activist who organizes for racial justice with her deported and returned community. She has participated in numerous trans local academic spaces, international media, and co-authored several publications. Welcome, Maggie. Thank you, Luce, for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. So excited for everyone to be here. We're now going to begin our moderating discussion. As a reminder, please feel free to engage with any of the panelists. We will be recording your questions and hopefully getting to many of them during the Q&A segment. So to get us started with the discussion, I thought it was important to begin by giving a brief context of how the U.S. immigration system is governed. And while there are many historical events we could get into, in your perspective, Oscar, what have been two to three things you believe have contributed to the immigration enforcement system we have today? Well, first of all, in echoing in many ways the words of Congressman Garcia, the history of U.S. immigration altogether has been very much a history of racial ethnic discrimination. Even before we had a formal U.S. immigration policy, we were known for our meanness against those who were newcomers. Uh, but, you know, when the newcomers happened to be non-white, uh, the problem only became worse. And as I said, I mean, we all need to remember the fact that we had a so-called um, ban against people from China uh, to actually become permanent residents or citizens, you know, just because we brought them and then we didn't like them. You know, and we wanted to basically make sure that they didn't find a way to basically become integrated into U.S. society. But the history of the formal U.S. immigration policy has been one that I would absolutely call uh, very consistent with white supremacist ideas. I mean, the basic notion, even when we adopted the U.S. immigration policy, was that if you were white, European, and preferably English-speaking, you were the good kind of immigrant. I mean, suffice to say that that is an idea that a former president of recent years pretty much echo, not inventing anything new, but simply echoing something that we've seen over the years. Uh, so white supremacy clearly is a problem. You know, number two, which I believe is very important to understand these numbers. Uh, the, the irony of U.S. recent immigration policy is that up until 1970, we didn't even really know what to do with Mexicans in the U.S. We didn't really know even where to place them, racially speaking, ethnically speaking. So for a short period of time, Mexicans were white. 
from an immigration policy perspective. However, beginning in 1970, which is the year that in many ways marks the beginning of the Mexicanization, Latinization of immigrants in the US, we clearly see a big shift. And the shift is directed primarily against these communities because of the demographic weight uh, that they began to exercise going back, as I said, the 1970s. And it is a trend that continues to be true today. In this respect, I think it is important to point out our immigration policy from 1970 forward has been one increasingly driven by the idea of criminalizing uh, the presence of those who are undesirable from the perspective of the dominant culture. And through the 1980s, we began taking steps essentially criminalizing immigrants. But nothing comes close to what happened in 1996. 1996 is a year when the country embraced an immigration policy that while never saying that it was against Mexicans or against people of Latin American origin, understanding that those are people of multiple ethnicities, multiple races, it has been indeed a policy that has affected primarily people of Mexican, Latin American origin. And it is enough to review data about who's being mostly detained over the past several decades, who are the people mostly deported uh, from the US, and most of all, the people mostly demonized in our public narrative regarding immigrants. So these are some of the characteristics that I believe is crucial to not lose track of when we talk about where we are today and the urgent need as of today to indeed change US immigration policy radically in a way that acknowledges that immigrants are actually a blessing for the US, but also a blessing for their countries of origin. Thank you, Oscar. I appreciate you providing that very broad perspective because I think with a lot of things happening right now, it's difficult to just think about, uh, really contextualize what has happened historically to bring us to where we are today. Um, so I appreciate that overview. I want to now bring in Dr. Garcia into the discussion. Um, you have done extensive academic research and authored several books and publications on the impact of the implementation of some of these things that Oscar has talked about. Specifically, there are certain programs that the Department of Homeland Security has created over the years to help enforce immigration law. Could you tell us a bit about uh, some of the most significant and how these programs may or may not interact with the criminal justice system? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I think a lot of people might ask themselves when we talk about living in a period of, of mass deportation, how is it that we got here? Um, and, and Oscar just gave us a really good historical overview of, of how we reached this point. And so what I wanna do is, is talk a little bit more about the technicalities, like the programs that have enabled, um, for example, the, the presidency of Barack Obama to have deported over 3 million immigrants. How did we do that? Um, and how did we do that? <clears throat> Underscoring that nearly all of the deportees uh, have been Latin American and Caribbean men. Um, removals reached this record level by infusing immigration enforcement into the work of state and local police officers um, in part. And so in other words, some of the federal government's authority over immigration enforcement had to be shifted down or devolved to lower levels of governance. The idea here uh, it, to, borrowing a military term, is to um, do a, a, a force multiplier kind of effort where you join um, the power of, of police with the power of immigration enforcement. And this happened in two ways. Um, and the first stemmed from um, the 1996 immigration reform that, that Oscar just uh, referenced. Um, this immigration reform, IRA IRA in 1996, not only made punitive changes to immigration laws, but section 287 part G of this bill authorized the federal government to enter into agreements with state and local police officers, law enforcement agencies, so that they could perform the functions of immigration officers. And so here we have a fundamental shift where we have a new legal framework for police to take an active role in the enforcement of federal civil immigration law. And this is an area that was previously viewed primarily, if not exclusively, a federal responsibility. It's interesting to know that Section 287G of IRA IRA went largely ignored for over five years after its passage. It wasn't until after the aftermath of September 11, 2001, 
that immigration and interior immigration enforcement became really conflated with issues of national security and terrorism. And so then we saw the 287G agreement uh, become quite active, um, growing each successive year under the Bush administration and into the first years of the, of the presidency of, of Barack Obama. We started to see really serious questions of discriminatory policing emerging in 287G programs, and this, this should not be uh, a very big surprise. Our own Department of Justice found constitutional violations against Latino communities, including racial profiling, and unlawful detentions associated with sweeps and checkpoints set up in Latino neighborhoods in jurisdictions with 287G programs. So um, soon we shifted, um, not entirely, but definitely pivoted towards a different kind of immigration enforcement program. This was Secure Communities, um, which uh, many call a misnomer, uh, has, has inserted a lot of insecurity into immigrant communities. As 287G uh, came under scrutiny, secure communities uh, kind of came into, into its light. It was started as a pilot program under the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, to identify deportable immigrants in jails and prisons. And this is sort of a big data moment. What it did specifically was allowed arrestees' fingerprint, fingerprints to be shared between the FBI, which is long screened for criminal records and outstanding warrants, and the Department of Homeland Security, which then performed these additional status and violation checks against immigration databases. And so every time someone is booked into, into jail or prison, they're fingerprinted. And now when matches indicate a potential immigration violation or unlawful presence, ICE agents can take custody of jailed immigrants and initiate removal. To do that, they had to issue detainers um, to arresting agencies. So this was essentially telling the arresting agency, please hold on to this person for me for up to two days after they should be released um, in order to allow ICE to come and pick them up. Like 287G, um, secure communities grow, grew really fast. In fact, it grew much faster. Um, it went from one activated jurisdiction in 2008 to have every single jurisdiction in the United States fully activated into the program in 2013. Similarly to 287G, um, secure communities ran into problems with discriminatory policing. Um, so for example, in the 2010 fiscal year, 60% of the total number of removals via secure communities consisted of immigrants with a single misdemeanor conviction. These are the people um, that Congressman Garcia was referring to who uh, may be deported for, for example, driving without a driver's license. Um, this influenced some states and localities to move to end their participation in the secure community programs. And then beginning in 2014, several federal court decisions found aspects of the secure community's detainers unconstitutional. So under this pressure, uh, sustaining secure communities became untenable. And in 2014, then DHS, DHS Secretary Johnson suspended the program. Um, the program was then uh, revived under the Trump administration, um, and I won't walk you through that administration's many uh, maneuvers around immigration enforcement, but these two programs um, helped drive the numbers of deportations up. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Your insight has helped us begin to see the different ways that the immigrant and criminal justice systems have essentially merged and what consequences, what consequences this is having on Black and Latino populations. Maggie, you have a very uh, interesting experience that I do not see in mainstream immigrant narratives. A lot of times discussions <clears throat> end at the point of detention or once the person is deported, but there is so much that happens after that. Can you tell us a little bit more about your own experience as an undocumented person who was forced to return to Mexico and the work that you are doing now with ODA? Yes, thank you, Dulce. Thank you, everybody. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not going to go into into the details of, of everything that has been mentioned already in terms of the impacts of white supremacy and racial profiling and criminalization in our communities in the United States. But I think I really want to share uh, about our experience on this side. I currently reside in Mexico for the last 14 years. I grew up undocumented, as Dulce said, in the U.S. And, and, and have now been living and organizing and working on this side. And I think as you mentioned, we hear a lot about detention and deportation 
in the United States, but we don't get to hear a lot about what happens to folks after that, after they cross the border south, what's happening. Um, and, and it's really interesting because the criminalization and the racial profiling and the white supremacy continues to impact our, our communities on this side. And one clear example of that, something that Oda has been doing for over eight years is organizing with community to continue to demand for mobility. So people in our community, uh, the majority of them have family living undocumented in the US or US citizens or are just part of mixed status families. And many of these people, even though they've been back to Mexico, whether they were deported or they were forced to return because we use the term forced to return because many of us are systemically pushed um, because of, of these policies that have already mentioned that sort of make us um, make this decision also because it's cheaper on, on the U.S. to for people to have to be afraid and, and, and return to their countries of origin is another way of uh, pushing people out. So something really important um, in terms of a project that we've been working on for the past eight years, which is called Visa Justice, has been accompanying people who have been back to Mexico to apply for B1, B2 non-immigrant visas. These people ha receive invitations from various universities across the US because they're community representatives in the work that we do. And many of them even study immigration issues on this side now. Um, it's really interesting to see though that accompanying folks in their interviews, we see the same discriminatory, the same racial profiling, and we see how the law, we, we've mentioned already IRA, IRA and the INA, and how all of this is justified within these legislations in the sense that, for example, immigrant intent, if someone goes to apply for a visa, they carry the burden of mm. having to prove that they're not intending to immigrate to the US. And having to prove this to a, to an adjudicator, a counselor who has prejudice, who has their own bias, who automatically will say no, um, is something really hard to overcome for people that did live undocumented in the US and that actually have family in the US. Um, they immediately are targeted for lying and that they're going to overstay, even if they have invitations, have a public event going on. And that is our case in our recent um, program right now that we're organizing where four people, two out of the four were denied, um, despite having the same purpose of travel, despite having uh, the similar professional social uh, connections to Mexico, economical, con like financial connections to Mexico, they were, two of them were denied um, just because uh, an adjudicator or counselor considered that they didn't believe them, right? And, and it's really interesting to see how these practices are replicated and how there isn't, the, the fact that the person says the truth and says, yes, I have family and I want to visit, which many, many people, the majority of the people use the tourist visa, which it, it even says it's to visit relatives and families. And it's really intense how the, the same discretion and the same, there's no justification, there's no appealing, there's no transparency when someone with this characteristics continues to be denied. Um, and I think that listening to all of you and, and hearing this language that is in the IRA IRA and in the INA in terms of the three, the 10 year bars, the immigrant in 10 and how deported and returned people are affected just disproportionately and in a different way because of their connections to the United States. And I think it's just another example of how these practices and these policies and these policing practices all sort of wrapped into this national security sort of discourse and narrative um, or are justified under that. I think that is something we need to work in changing in our legislation and in our um, counselor practices and policies. Thank you. I think what you just described is how embedded and dehumanizing uh, the different systems that we currently have are, not just from you know being in the U.S. and trying to uh, apply for a permanent status, but also even those that are in Mexico trying to come in either to visit uh, or to study, as you mentioned. Um, I think that that's been very helpful just to see, like, get a whole picture that it's not just when we're in the U.S., but also even after we're deported, we're still being criminalized. Um, thank you. So now I want to uh, I want to know more now that we know more about the historical context, uh, how immigration enforcement is being implemented and the criminalization that takes place after de after deportation. I want to talk about how U.S. policy is being handled today. 
Well, Scott, what are some of the ways that we are seeing racial profiling or discrimination play out and some of the major debates currently happening related to border asylum and or detention in the U.S.? Well, thank you, Dulce. Um, I think it's important to understand how the essential premises of the public policy uh, pathway that we have pursued uh, essentially, as I said before, since the 1970s, when it comes to being so profoundly anti-Mexican, anti-Latin American, just keep finding new way of expressing itself and sometimes reusing all the schemes uh, that can be put to use, you know, in this particular context. There are so many things I could say, but I'm going to focus on two that I believe are particularly useful uh, to bring to, to everyone's attention at this point in time. First of all, Title 42. You know, Title 42 is a very old uh, health uh, uh, measure that was adopted back in the 1940s uh, to try to prevent, you know, the spread of disease, which I have serious questions as to whether it was ever valid, uh, but it was used essentially to say that if foreign nationals represent a public health threat to the country, the U.S. has the power to simply deny entry and immediately send them back. That measure you know, was brought back into life uh, by uh, the previous uh, administration, the Trump administration, essentially alleging that immigrants arriving to the U.S. Uh, southern border without permission uh, were potentially carriers of COVID-19 and that therefore they needed to be stopped and they needed to be sent back right away in an expedited uh, manner. Uh, that, ironically, was a policy that during the electoral campaign in 2020 was strongly criticized by President Biden. I mean, he criticized it for, indeed, what it is, an inhumane uh, approach, you know, to a, a humanitarian crisis, which is really what's going on, you know, in countries uh, throughout uh, the southern uh, uh, neighborhood region uh, to the U.S., uh, to basically keep people from entering, keep people from filing uh, asylum petitions in the U.S., and furthermore, send them back right away in expedited uh, uh, detentions or deportations. So that is a law that sadly uh, remains in place. Uh, President Biden promised that he was going to indeed do away with such a measure, but sadly, it hasn't happened, and it continues to be used today, and it continues to be used essentially to destroy the possibility for people to pursue humanitarian protection via asylum and other measures uh, of the same type in the U.S. Um, so that's number one. Number two is the creation of a program that has also brought incredible hardship to people who were already uh, coming out from hardship in their own countries and hoping to find support and protection in the U.S. And it is the program known popularly as Stay in Mexico or Quédate en México uh, in Spanish, which is basically another measure to achieve the same goal. You know, keep people from entering the U.S., uh, keep people from pursuing asylum applications in the U.S., and instead place them in a very precarious situation at the U.S. southern uh, border with Mexico, um, and, and keep them in conditions that are incredibly uh, fragile, incredibly vulnerable, uh, people are abusing multiple ways while waiting, supposedly to have a chance to enter the U.S. And again, if you look at who are the victims, you know, who are the people experiencing pain as a result of both uh, the use of Title 42 as well as Quédate en México, they are by and large, you know, people from Mexico, people from El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and of course, many other countries that try to enter the U.S. via the U.S. southern border from multiple countries. We, we all remember the case of Haitians uh, last year and the images that we saw. You know, what I kept reminding people is that I was so uh, glad that that was caught in video, but let's not make a mistake uh, of assuming that what was happening with Haitians was the first time ever in the history of the U.S. that we were doing such kind of atrocities. I mean, we've been mistreating people for decades, you know, some may argue for centuries, uh, but it just so happened uh, that we captured in video and in photos, you know, what happened to Haitians. So again, these are just two 
uh, uh, Dulce, of examples of how these things keep resurfacing again. And let me just say one other thing before I, I, I let you go. Uh, I think it's important to remember the United States of America has had a serious addiction with putting people in jail. You know, we are the worst nation in the planet, you know, when it comes to putting people in jail. You know, we are the country with the largest population of inmate population and the largest population, uh, pro uh, proportionally speaking, of people in jail than any other country, if you can possibly believe it. And I think it's important to mention part of what happened with 1996 with IRA, the, the law that was uh, passed in September of that year, is that it also tweaked the concept of criminal. You know, if you commit more than one immigration infraction and you are caught, you are then deemed criminal. And so when Barack Obama administration told us that they were deporting criminals, the idea in people's mind is that they were deporting violent criminals. No, they were deporting people who sat simply committed more than one, you know, U.S. immigration infraction. And it's important to keep that in mind because of the way we use language and what does it really mean. Thank you, Oscar. I think those are really good examples of what's actively happening right now. And it's just made it more evident that this targeting and exclusion of immigrants of color goes beyond just enforcement practices within the US, uh, within the country, but also uh, at the border and barring people from seeking uh, their you know, rightful uh, uh, human right to pursue uh, asylum here in the US. Dr. Garcia, these situations and reactions that Oscar mentions continue to play out in the news. And as we know, in our communities, news travels quickly and it influences the way that we feel as people in, this, in society. Some of your most recent work touches on how enforcement, legality and other factors impact immigrants' everyday lives. What are some ways that you have seen immigration enforcement and legality influence the behavior or perhaps even the mentality of immigrants in things such as civic involvement, seeking health care, other social services? Thanks, Dulce. It's such a good question. Um, I think I want to start by saying um, that the undocumented immigrant population in the United States is very settled, um, in part because of, again, shifts in the 1990s with border enforcement um, and this policy of prevention through deterrence at the U.S.-Mexico border that's really funneled border crossers to cross it at, through natural uh, environments that are deadly. Um, and thus, people who are already in the United States um, find themselves sealed in because circular unauthorized migration is expensive, it's dangerous, and as I've said, often deadly. So undocumented people are largely staying put here. Um, and about two thirds of unauthorized immigrants uh, have lived in the US for more than 10 years. For undocumented people from Mexico, that pattern's more pronounced. Um, the vast majority, 83%, have been in the country for more than 10 years. Um, so what does that mean? There's an anthropologist, um, Nicolas de Genova, who uses this concept of deportability. Um, and what he means by that is he refers to a constant possibility of deportation, um, one that fundamentally shapes the lives of undocumented people and everyone that's connected to them. And that's related to what another scholar, sociologist uh, Cecilia Menjivar, calls a hyper-awareness of the law, where if you're undocumented, you're thinking of the law and what the government does and legal status before you engage in even routine activities. So both of those kind of um, observations, um, very uh, kind of obvious observations for people uh, who, are, who are living this in their everyday lives, have led media, um, some activists, some scholars towards this narrative of undocumented immigrants being hidden in the shadows. And in an academic work, we call this system avoidance. Um, and so I wanna say something that I hope isn't um, too, too nuanced to sort of lose the main message here. One thing I wanna say is yes, there is absolutely a chilling effect. Um, for example, we have, we have so many examples of this, but I'll just call out one. We see this with the Trump era public charge rule, which discouraged many immigrant families from using benefits, public benefits for which they were eligible. At the same time, I also wanna say that this narrative of hiding in the shadows is far too broad. It strips immigrants of their agency and it really takes away the realities of everyday undocumented life. Um, the necessity to engage at a basic level, to take kids to school, to buy groceries, to go to the laundromat, to seek out healthcare, and so in, in some of my work, I, I argue that where undocumented people live um, helps determine how they plug into their communities. 
So states and localities that develop restrictive um, local or state level immigration measures that are layering over the federal approach are really injecting threat deep into the lives of undocumented immigrants and their families, laying it at their doorsteps. But um, by and large, these immigrants are not self-deporting. They're not erased from the community, but they are engaging in everyday life in a way um, that's focused on subverting a public gaze, avoiding um, immigration enforcement, for example. There are other states and localities that develop far more accommodating immigration measures. And so these aren't a panacea. Um, I don't want to offer up a, a silver bullet or a, a, a shiny solution. But states and localities that provide a measure of protection and support to undocumented immigrants have seen um, that interactions with local government, advocacy and nonprofit orgs, religious and community institutions have grown. And so we might look at this as a way of bolstering um, place based membership or a possibility of greater quality of outcomes across entire communities when we look at, at changes at the local level. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for that thoughtful response. A lot of immigrants feel like they can't do certain things, and that is tied to how we are talked about and portrayed in the media by our government. Switching gears a little bit, I'd like to hear from Maggie about some of the ways people in Mexico are also actively working towards decriminalizing migration and fighting unfair policy practices. Thank you, Dulce. Yeah, I think that... Um... I mean, also continuing to to talk and add to the conversation and support the legislation, the new way forward. I think it really has a lot of language and, and it would really resolve a lot of the criminalization and the racial profiling that, that we've mentioned earlier. So I think that one thing that uh, is important for us is to continue to organize and push for this conversation around the new way forward, but also the current white paper also called uh, A Chance to Come Home, which is a, a paper that also proposes to open an office um, that is run by DHS that will allow applications of deported and forcibly returned families to consider to return. Um, I think that also around the, the discourse and the conversation, we're talking about the importance of eliminating the three and the 10 year bar. Um, that a lot of people in our community, even people that didn't know they had a bar, they they know that they have a bar when they try to have an interview for a non-immigrant or an immigrant visa. They are told that they have this tenure bar, even if they return, even if they were just six months after becoming 18 years and a half, they face this condition. And we think that that is important to organize and advocate. Um, and also creating for the for the U.S. embassies and the consulars to create this directive that requires officers to consider actually temporary family reunification of return and deported individuals as a positive discretionary factor at the time of uh, issuing a non-immigrant or an immigrant visa. Um, we think that that is important um, and it's a, a step that we're advocating and organizing and, and overall this message of, of um, what, can, what else can we do when people uh, are continuing to demand their right to mobility, their right to family reunification, and also how, as you mentioned earlier, the, the people that are impacted and affected are not only deported and returned, but also U.S. citizens, also uh, school officials, um, employers, like everybody in the community is affected when people get detained and deported. And I think we need to start um, seeing the impacts that that deportation and detention and exiling people uh, have in the communities in the U.S. and what's creating or it has been creating for a long time. Um, is a lot of the work that we're trying to give visibility um, and the messaging and how we can continue to advocate and push for these changes that for us are really important and that specially focus in in IRA, IRA, which is like something super old that has never like if the consequences that are in this in this legislation and in these policies like really continue to critically uh, affect our communities of color and our Latino communities. Thank you, Maggie. 
hearing about the different priorities that ODA has been working on has been very helpful to give us an idea of what orgs in Mexico are currently doing. And I agree with you in that there are things that decision makers can do right now to begin to undo the harms of this system. This concludes our facilitated portion of the, of the panel. Um, it feels as though we have only touched the surface of so many intersecting topics, uh, but I hope that this portion of the panel has provided a good overview for the audience to see how we have come to the immigration system we have today and the real life consequences of racially charged policies and practices that impact citizens and non-citizens in the US and in other countries. We will now move on to our Q&A segment for our first question, um, this is open to all of you. We've talked about some very heavy topics and uh, one of our viewers would like to know, as advocates in this space, I'm sure there are a lot of challenges with practicing your energy and mental health, with protecting your energy and mental health. How do you all balance prioritizing your own, well, your own well-being with the fierce advocacy you do? This is open to whoever would like to start. Maggie, do you want to chime in? Wow, I mean that's that's a good question, and I think it's something we we try to practice every day um, in our in our work environment, in our advocacy work. I think that, I mean that's really important for us in Oda. I think that that using artistic practices of using other outlets that can really not only help us to 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 express, to heal, to take, to collectively care for each other. But I think that through many artistic practices, we're also able to sort of transfer, transfer or transform that rage and, and, and everything that continues to be accumulated, not only by our stories, but our community and our family and the results and the implications of these policies that I think that through art is a way to channel it um, and, and channel it and for it to, to become other possibilities and be able to maybe have access to other uh, fabrics um, in society. Um, so I think that art would be a, my answer and, and collective work um, is also part of, of taking care of each other. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, do either of you also want to contribute? I mean, all I can say is uh, family. It's very important. I mean, the, and I don't mean just blood family, but also the families that we adopt, you know, in the process. The, the work that people like us do can be very stressing, you know, can be indeed uh, practices that lead to people getting burnout, which is a term that I don't yet fully understand in the U.S., uh, but I hear it all the time. Uh, I have the fortune to have known realities that are far more challenging than the realities we deal in the U.S. You know, I'm Salvadorian by birth. Uh, I spent the first 12 years of my life in the U.S. advocating for people who were victims of war in El Salvador, and that was very heartbreaking. And family uh, telling uh, jokes all the time, laughing even in the middle of painful experiences are all very important uh, remedies that we can use to keep in mind that we're not running a 100 meter race. You know, we are running a, a lifelong marathon. And if you are for a lifelong marathon, you absolutely need to also learn how to pause. And I think that that is something that I have practiced throughout uh, my life. You know, enjoy every moment I can while also I work as hard as I can, because for me, this is a life vocation, a life commitment, which is why I continue to do it. Thank you, Oscar. Oh. You're on mute, Dr. Garcia. <laughs> you all warned me about that. Sorry, it was me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to respond by saying that, you know, and as, as an educator, um, I think I really value the students in my classroom as a public. Um, and so there's um, kind of nothing more impactful for me than thinking on the macro scale about the kind of research that I do and then seeing on the micro scale students who are uh, coming out of that environment um, and, and pushing to understand it better and to make change. Um, and so that's where I feel fortunate to be able to really lean into um, both education and, and research connected together. Thank you. We have a question from the audience from Maggie. Uh, can you please tell us how Otros Dreams and Acción addresses the needs of children or youth who experience deportation? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think that uh, in all the, a lot of the work that we seek is to also uh, listen and have conversations with youth um, and with children, which is very, we, we've really seen that it, it, it's dealt in a very different way um, through right now this year, for example, there's a summer program going on for, for kids and youth, not only in Mexico, like there is a lot that we've done in terms of the impacts that that deportation and forced return have in them, but also in the U.S. And I think it's something we talked previously also with Dulce about the impacts of the youth and the children that stay in the U.S. and that have lost a, 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 their mom or their dad or both of their parents to deportation and the impacts that this has on uh, on them on the other side and how this is also a problem that should be addressed by by the U.S. because many of them are really being affected and are falling into many uh, circumstances that because of what happened to their to their families is really it, it has a long term implication that continues to replicate the systems that we live now. So I think that there's a lot of work in in listening and working and having conversations through um, a very a, a lens of truly listening and wanting to be there and supporting them um, and creating these networks and different outlets for, for youth on this side in Mexico that we've done. But I think we've also wanting to to be more proactive and more active with kids and youth on the U.S. side that are having a, a difficulty time. And, and the parents who are on this side, like parenting across the border, it's something really awful that that I think a lot of parents struggle and families in general struggle um, because of the same impacts of these policies that we've been talking about. Thank you for mentioning that, because I, I, I do think that often we talk about these things in, in silos or, you know, we have a family in the U.S. and their father is deported or their mother is deported and now the family is separated. Um, but we don't talk enough about those mental health aspects or the long term that a long term effects that that has on the development of the child. And I think that that's something that we need to place more focus on when we're thinking about what it is that we're really doing with these immigration policies and we're deporting people based on things that dehumanize uh, the person. I want to now uh, turn to a question from the audience that's for Oscar. Uh, we saw in a previous briefing a mention of how immigration is a key aspect to addressing the current labor shortage. Could any could any of you, uh, but I was just thinking maybe this fits with Oscar, but whoever wants to um, chime in can uh, speak to this idea and to, and to the protection and to protection for working immigrants. Well, certainly, I think that we all have seen the news about where do we stand in terms of um, unemployment rate. Um, anybody who works through any major city can also testify that there are uh, help wanted signs all over the place. Uh, and yet, you know, there is uh, an issue regarding uh, the, the question of temporary worker visas, which is exactly what is being talked about. But let me just say that there is a common sense equity question. How can we be talking about bringing in more uh, workers, which is something that we probably should do, just looking at the data, uh, when we have millions of people who have earned equity in the country and to whom we deny the possibility of actually becoming fully integrated as immigrants able down the road to apply so they wish for US uh, citizenship. Uh, that is a question that we need to not lose uh, perspective of. And again, I mean, this goes back to something I said earlier. Uh, immigrants have been an incredible net gain for the US. And yes, deportation causes a lot of harm our communities are incredibly resilient and, and able to bounce back. But, and in some instances, I have to say, especially when it involves uh, minors, children, uh, the damages are for life. But let's keep remember, uh, remembering, uh, immigrants are all together an incredible asset. And I, for one, believe that as we dare to come out with correct, uh, appropriate public policy measures to overcome the mess we now have, much more uh, realistic visa programs for people who really want to come just to work for a few years should be part of the equation. But I wouldn't say that that is the only way to actually address issues of labor shortage. Uh, keep in mind that there are still a lot of, a lot of people long-term unemployed in the U.S., not because they want, 
but because the system is not good enough to actually enable people to keep employed, which is what I would dare to say most people would want to be able to do. Thank you, Oscar. Anybody else want to chime in or we could move on to the next question? Okay. Uh, there's one in particular that I think would really uh, be helpful in closing out this portion, and it's uh, talking about what should local governments do to support undocumented communities and lessen the fear and negative impacts, and this can be open to anyone. Well, I'll just talk about a, a few policy things. I mean, I think, again, there's, there's no magic potion for this, and anything that states and localities can do. Um, wh while I want to point out some things of value, um, I also want to say that while we have the federal system that we have that, that governs exit and entry and enforcement, um, states and localities' hands are, are tied to some extent um, in, in terms of what they can do. At the same time, there are some important innovations that are happening at the state and local level. I would say, in fact, that's where all of the innovation is happening right now around immigration policy. So we have um, sanctuary ordinances with teeth in some localities that prohibit collaboration between local law enforcement and, and immigration enforcement at the federal level. That's really important. Chicago's had iterations of these since the 1980s. Um, some states are extending health care coverage to elderly undocumented people. The state of Illinois uh, just became the first state in the United States to extend health care coverage to undocumented people who are 65 or older who have incomes below the federal poverty level. That's a critical support, um, as is extending in-state college tuition to undocumented uh, students. Um, I think, as I've said before, these not only provide tangible supports, um, but also can help cha change the, the rhetoric and shift framing uh, around immigrants and think about um, everyone within a bounded jurisdiction as an important member of that community um, with real value um, for, for all of us. Um, so these are small things, um, but I think can have uh, a, a critical small steps um, and potentially push the federal government to move. I mean, that would be the that would be the ultimate kind of um, optimistic take here is that there would be um, such a progressive push for immigration reform at the state and local level that um, the federal government would be forced to act. Um, as we saw, for example, the Obama administration being forced to act around DACA and DAPA uh, because of this pressure from activist communities. Um, and states and localities kind of riding, riding that along forward. If I may add quickly to that uh, response um, by Dr. Garcia, there are so many things that are yet to be done, you know, by localities. But there is one that I consider absolutely imperative, and it is break away once and for all with the toxic narrative that is still dominant today that suggests that immigrants are something bad for the country. I would love to see more mayors, more governors, more elected officials at the local level clashing head on, you know, with this narrative and affirming the truth. And the truth is that these places would not be able to function, you know, without what immigrants represent in every respect, not just workers, but, you know, imagine how boring it would be, you know, a city like Chicago, without all the choices we have when it comes to food, when it comes to arts, when it comes to culture, thanks to immigration. So we should be talking completely differently about the immigrants' experience and the immigration policy that the country should have, but it doesn't. That's a very easy beginning, which we aren't really doing enough of. I agree with you, Oscar. Thank you both for that thoughtful uh, response. I, I thought it was a really important question to help close this portion um, because there is a lot of things that we can do. We've been waiting many years uh, at the federal level for different things to happen and you know, we continue to wait, but there is a lot of power in local and state uh, uh, governments to make you know, cities more welcoming and to give people more access to the services that they need so they can become even more um, better contributors to our communities and that they are provided with and treated as, as humans. Um, so thank you to everyone that submitted a question. I really wish that we could get through all of them, but we will be dropping in the chat, the panelists' contact information for you to connect with them. Before closing today's events, I'd love to hear some final words from our guests. 
If you would have our audience take away only one thing from today's panel, what would that be? And I'm gonna start with Dr. Garcia. Oh my gosh, that's such a weighty, a weighty thing to ask. Um, I think um, probably what I would say <clears throat> is that the most important thing that we can think about doing is pushing for a broad comprehensive immigration reform and not shying away from a legalization program that is um, unburdened by uh, cost by um, a gauntlet of um, paperwork and administrative burden and time. Um, the average undocumented person in the United States is 39 years old. If we make them wait eight to 10 years on a pathway to citizenship, um, we're looking at people entering into late middle life and older life. Um, it doesn't make any sense. And if we're going to move forward in a way that is thinking about offering people um, full legal recognition, um, which for me is a full affirmation of their humanity. Uh, we need to do that quickly in a way that um, that puts on the back burner administrative burden and puts on the front burner um, this idea of administrative justice or how can we make this happen um, as, as quickly as possible to account for the time that has been uh, stolen from undocumented communities who have lived in an undocumented status for so long. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. It is a weighty question, um, and now I'll ask Oscar to give us his weighty answer. <laughs> if one thing I would love the audience to take away is that Mexicanas and Mexicanos, Salvadreñas and Salvadreños, Central Americans in general, and Black immigrants are incredibly beautiful people that should indeed get our respect, uh, the dignity that they deserve, and that contrary to whatever you may have heard, we are again among the most beautiful human beings you will ever be around. That's it. Thank you, Oscar. And closing us out, Maggie. I think, yeah, I mean, I would definitely want people to leave with this idea of looking more on what's happening after deportation, what's happening in the Southern border but also in other countries where there continues or there has been a huge impact with deportation and families returning, um, but also questioning and, 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 and questioning and also from where each person stands, figuring out how you can get involved, what your role as a U.S. citizen, what your role is as a congressional officer, what your role is as an organization or just a family who has been affected by deportation or forced return um, can do and should be doing. And I think reaching out and continuing to organize um, is really important, but also continuing to hold this country accountable in demanding restoration and reparation because it's not something that you're giving people or that we're asking for people. I mean, it's something that is owed and something that um, there's generations of of harm that has been happening in in, in the United States government or the, or these policies and these practices and these ideas, these narratives are responsible. And I think that um, questioning and holding accountable and organizing and connecting um, and in this case, looking at uh, deportation, like families that have been deported or returning and figuring out a way how to use your resources and support to add, add to, to this organizing translocal, transnational approach is something very important. Thank you, Maggie. To quote one of our viewers, Diana, together we can do so much more and this is key. So thank you to all our viewers and our distinguished panelists for joining us today and for sharing their expertise on this important and pressing issue that requires immediate action. Today's panel has presented a clear picture of the urgent need to examine how the current immigration system is severely affecting Latino and Black communities in the U.S. I want to thank Oscar for sharing more about the role of anti-Mexican sentiment, white supremacy, and the influence of policies like IRA IRA. Dr. Garcia for her insight on what these policies have looked like in practice, and Maggie for sharing with us the experiences of immigrants who continue to be criminalized even after deportation. I wanna briefly highlight a few key recommendations for policymakers and advocates to help push for structural change. These will help to inform ways we can begin to undo the harms of the past. Number one, implement accountability mechanisms to hold ICE and CBP agents accountable four patterns of racial profiling and constitutional violations. Number two, 
repeal section, section 1325 of the INA to return to the pre-1996 wording of the act, which defined crossing the border without authorization as a civil offense and was enforced through administrative or legal proceedings as opposed to a federal crime. Number three, end the 287G program and prohibit the cooperation of local law enforcement with the Department of Homeland Security. Thank you once again to CHCI for hosting and helping us to prepare for today's event. Our panelists and Congressman Garcia for their work and the audience for joining and participating today. This concludes our panel discussion, but not the important work that remains to be done. We look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you.